Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new spoiler review for the Acolyte here on Geek Bites, brought to you by the Geek Buddies. <gasps> hey! Hey! Yeah. Well, we're back at it, Shannon, into the world of the Ac- Acolyte episode six here, Teach Slash Corrupt. We're also back at the two word titles to reflect May and OSHA being separated yet again and going into separate stories and dealing with separate new masters, in essence, as they're navigating these situations here as OSHA is there on some unknown planet or with Chimer, and then uh, uh, May is disguised as OSHA. They're on the ship with Sol. We get some Vernestra action going on as well. So uh, we're going to get into all of it. We're going to spoil it here. If you guys haven't seen the episode, go and watch the episode to come back and then watch our review. Or if you don't care, because you're out on the show anyway, you just enjoy us talking about the show, then stick around. We're certainly going to spoil it. And unfortunately, we do not have Michael Vogel for this particular uh, review because he's out on vacation, but he will be back by next week for to continue the, uh, the saga of the Acolyte for sure. Shannon, you know I trust you. You know I love you. Always enjoy having conversations with you about this stuff. Where are we after a thrilling episode five here? As I said, episode six kind of slows things down a little bit. It's it's May and Soul on the ship. It's Osha and Chimera on this unknown planet. And it's Renestra doing Prince Humperdinck trying to figure out what happened there with this great battle. So your idea, your thoughts overall on this particular episode, my friend? I mean, this this is par for the course that the acolyte set early on that mm. it's fine um that you have some really really great moments you have you have a handful of really good performances that are flanked by just a lot of kind of amateurish writing and directing and editing um you know the I, I can definitely appreciate the performances of Manny Jacinto and Lee Jung Jae and Amanda List Steinberg is 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 working her hardest yeah. <laughs> but but it yeah. it takes it takes a really 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 talented actor to fill in the gaps that the store that the writing has left that i don't think amanda stenberg is there and this is not her fault right <laughs> i mean this is th- this is something that it, that that an actor shouldn't be asked to do this this should have been taken care of in the writing of the show um you know like some of the concepts that they that they visit mainly with uh with, with Chimere and Osha I'm like oh this is this is really interesting but it kind of reminds me of Obi-Wan Obi-Wan Kenobi where I think we were maybe three or four episodes in I'm like all right is this a, a good show with bad moments or a bad mm-hmm. show with good moments and I think the acolyte is very firmly in the bad show with good moments category wow strong statements yeah, I would say uh, I'm so, just slightly higher on you on it but still absolutely concede that this is a show that is at times super disappointing because it's confounding some of the story decisions that they make and certainly this episode as you said brought back the feelings of the first few episodes which are this is a fine show that has promise and potential that never quite that that adds to the frustration because the potential moments the all the cool moments the good moments they're not consistent throughout the episodes, Unfor- except for like maybe episode five. Even in episode five, as we pointed out last week, had some story issues and character issues. The frustrating part of all of this is that there just isn't a consistency and quality overall in these episodes. And it becomes super frustrating when you glimpse at the greatness that this show could have been, but doesn't quite go there because of like um, uh, clumsy, awkward humor moments that make no sense, that undercut the stakes. Or someone getting completely converted to taste the dark side within a day, uh, or someone who is uh, tricking everybody, but no, I'm not tricking, and now there's something else going on, and so it just doesn't quite get there the way it should. And I don't know if it's the writing or the direction. By the way, director uh, uh, Hanel M. Culpepper for this one, Leslie Headland and Jocelyn Bio wrote this one. I don't know, but there were elements here, as you said, there were moments here that I thought were interesting. But overall, they ask you to believe too much. And again, it slides into a little bit of a simplistic approach to all of this. And again, the fact that they haven't done enough to really lay the groundwork of May and Osha by hiding critical elements of their background, it does not help us connect and feel um, these emotional journeys they're going on uh, in in these episodes. And it's super, super frustrating. I get pulling back 
from episode five because there's a lot of action. Like, of course, everybody want to calm down. We're gonna go to our respective corners, figure out what we're gonna do next. But it has to be more engaging, right? And I saw some people, some reviews calling it thrilling and exciting, and I'm like, I, I wish I saw what you're seeing. And, and maybe we're asking too much of the show. That occurred to me too, Shannon. At the end of this episode, I was like, maybe we're asking too much of this show. I don't know because it really is confounding to me. This is not the Leslie Headland that I know from from Russian Doll or from uh, from um, uh, Single Drunk Female. Like, th there's those quality shows, and this seems to stumble with these clashing tones consistently. So, uh, but we're gonna break it down into sections. We're we're gonna start with the uh, Chimera and Osha uh, situation there, and then we'll jump to Soul and oh, sorry, May and Soul there, and then we'll finish up with Vernestra. So. Jen, let's get into the first part here. Let's bring up these uh, cute couple, this cute couple on the island, this unknown island here. They're on an unknown planet, rather, that looks like Octu. But I also saw people speculating that it could be Baldemnik from the Legends continuity. Baldemnik is where Doth Plagueis killed his master, master in Legends while also holding stores of rare Cortosis. So there may be a Plagueis connection here. I don't know, Shannon. But I found this to be a bit of a disappointment of a seduction to the dark side scene. And maybe because I'm older and I've seen so many cult documentaries, I could see through this from a mile away. You know, we she wakes up alone there in the cave. She stumbles out to find him. And she stumbles out and she, she's wearing clothes very similar to Ray to give that Octo vibe. Uh, and then he's walking in the distance. She sees him. She follows him with her knife, a maze knife there. Uh, he goes to a pool or a pond or a lake or whatever, disrobes, you know, disrobes there to bring the uh, seduction aspect of it all uh, to the forefront here. Let's her grab the saber while his back is turned to the water. He talks to her then. Then he walks out naked. Second show this week with his cock akimbo. And then piece by piece <laughs> tries to influence her to the dark side while she says she can't be seduced like May. Uh, she she says, you know, he says he was a Jedi and was kicked out uh, and confirms that the helmet was built from cortosis and it could block thoughts and it's a sensory deprivation piece. It's just you and the force, he says, and what you bring with you, as I showed you there, conveniently shows his scar to get sympathy. And within a day, she's corrupted so quickly that she's putting on the helmet. So, Shannon, I, talk to me about this whole these whole sections of this show. Did this work for you? Did, did you buy the seduction? Or did this feel like, okay, we're just going to check the boxes. We're going to mention power of two. And we're, clearly he's looking for some protege uh, protege rather to be uh, to be his uh, uh, acolyte well your thoughts yeah the speed in which osha gets on board or, or or starts to starts to you know dip her toe in the dark side pool it, yeah it's fast but but i think the performances of manny jacinto and amanda stenberg actually it, that that's why the story didn't bother me is because okay. i kind of believed where they were i think when you look at the character of osha who from the beginning has been unsettled. And <laughs> I I'm trying to give a a enough grace to the story here that like <laughs> this is someone who is who has been on their heels um, and may have finally found something. Like, like someone that's like, oh, this, this person is now speaking sense to me, despite the fact that I just watched them kill a bunch of people yes! <laughs> that, 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 you know, that I was friends with. Um, <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> but the way that Chimere then reasons, he's like, I killed Jedi that were trying that were trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the performance of Manny Jacinto, just this very measured delivery of this dialogue. Um, I, I, I bought where he was coming from. I thought it was interesting that he is in black. Before, he disrobes, he goes into the pool he comes out and he's in white mm -hmm. uh, i was like okay well that's 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 an interesting that was an interesting choice and sure. you know uh uh you know big big shout out to manager Sinto and his trainer for the massive shoulders <laughs> that guy. Where, is, where is this gym in the world of the sith i mean kylo ren and manager <laughs> where is this fucking gym that they all go to i would like to know where this gym is Dude, does going to the dark side to give you abs and muscles like this I <laughs> but again the story the story didn't bother me like i do understand that it's fast but it's like okay she has the opportunity to leave she has the opportunity to kill him and she's not she's she's not doing it for either one for you know she, she's not trying to kill him she's not trying to leave so i'm kind of like okay let's i'm interested to see where this is going she talks about her sister a little bit 
basically like I'm not so easily corrupted. Yeah. And he's like, why don't why don't you turn it on? A Jedi doesn't a, a Jedi doesn't attack the unarmed. He's like, who said you why do you keep calling yourself a Jedi? Like the whole idea, like they threw you away. Yeah. Like that whole concept um is really, really interesting to me. So the the storyline I was actually on board with, but for the folks that do have um an issue with the speed in which it happened i understand but for this particular episode that speed didn't bother me yeah it did bother me though so i'll flat out admit it that's that mm -hmm. did have issues with the speed of this because to me if like you said uh, jackie who the show has told us and was feeding us there was a strong relationship between her and jackie her and yord had years of friendship before she left the jedi so all of that has been rekindled or started for the first time in Jackie's case. And to have them die in such a brutal way at his hands, and she's willing to be like, well, he looks really good with a shirt on. Let me hear more of what he has to say. It, it, that just bothered me on so many levels. And please don't, people like, oh, well, he's using the seduction of the of the dark side. And, but it's stuff we've heard or seen before. There was nothing here that was unusual or different or unique in the approach. I agree with you. Manny Jacinto, absolutely. I mean, I think that's what's doing a lot of the work is the delivery, the confidence of his performance, and, of course, his look and how he looks physically and all of that. It all helps to uh, to help you believe it. But in the end, I didn't – I was just frustrated by the pace. This should have gone over a few days. She should have resisted harder. She should have fought against it. She should have – like, there has to come a point where she breaks. Uh, she should have tried to swim out. Like, there should have been efforts to escape, and there weren't, right? There was just like, oh, let me see what happens. She turns on the lightsaber in that moment, and that was a really clunky emotional moment uh, when he's trying to say, like, they threw her out and stuff and that she didn't leave of her own volition. It's very weak what he's trying to do in seducing her because there are holes in that logic that she could easily poke holes in. And listen, the way we were presented to her, she's a mechanic, which means... She's out there dealing with shit. She knows how to troubleshoot a situation. She knows how to figure stuff out. And I think she was actually just living her life. Yeah, Jedi thing didn't work out for me, but I'm fixing ships. I'm cool. I got my little pip. I'm good to go. I got dragged into this. Now I'm confronting all of this stuff. And I just felt like this should have been a much more darker, um, uh, sinister scene, more should have gotten deeper into her and, and broke through her defenses. Like there should have been more logic here. To have it happen within a day after she says I'm not as easily seduced as May undercuts her strength as a character, in my opinion. And putting on the helmet and hearing the Darth Vader breathing, I don't know where you're going with that. I don't know where you're leading us to with that. That being said, though, I did enjoy these elements that the character of Chimer is throwing out there, right? The idea that he was a Jedi, he was thrown away by the Jedi, and he has this scar on his back that could be either Force Lightning or possibly a lightsaber whip, so that we see the scar. So there's intrigue and mystery around what Manny Jacinto is doing. And I do think, Shannon, I gotta say, like, Amandala Stenberg is in the show, same show with Manny Jacinto. And I get it, Manny's like 10 years older than Amandala, so maybe Amandala is still kind of getting up to speed as an actress. But, like, if Manny's delivering a performance like that with the same script that's being written, you gotta have some questions about some of the lesser performances that are being brought out by by some of these actors in these in certain situations so just kind of looking at it that way i don't know if i'm off base on that but that's how i feel Go, yeah i mean I, I i understand the criticism i do i do understand the criticism i think amanda stenberg is having to do more more heavy lifting in terms of volume um in that she is playing two roles yeah, fair. um of of the role, like if she's playing the two lead roles, and of all the roles written, her yeah. her roles are the most underwritten. Yes. Um. So so typically, like if you have if you have an underwritten role, there's a lot that can be done with star power or with someone who is a seasoned, exceptionally talented actor. Again, yeah. like they can fill in. They can not always. It doesn't always work, but they yeah. can fill in the holes left by the writing. And I don't think. I don't think she is at that level yet right. to to have that capability. Um, in terms of what you talked about, the um, the the length about yeah. this should have been a couple of days. You know, I don't disagree with you there. Yeah. Um, I think the idea that she wakes up, she sees Chimer, she immediately runs, she sees the ship, she gets in the water, yeah. something's in that water, and he ends up saving her. 
Like there, there right, were ways right, to right. sort there of ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. strengthen, strengthen that storyline rather than her, you know, doing a little, uh, uh peeping Tom yeah. <laughs> as he, as he takes right. a dip. Um, I, I think there was probably a way to combine all that stuff yeah. to strengthen that storyline, but for whatever reason they chose, um, the path of brevity. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not powerful to have her be easily seduced. It just isn't. And there should be more resist. And there's an opportunity, J uh, Shannon, to grow the character in her resistance to in her confrontation. And I, you know, I get it. She, she's a, she's a strong-willed character. So there should be more here. And she's seen some shit. So there should be more here in pushing back. Um, and the fact that he was a Jedi, there could be something there where she kind of breaks through to him and break some of his walls down. So it becomes a little bit more of a, a quid pro quo type of situation. And then you form a relationship through that. That's believable. That being said, though, I don't know where they're leading with this, um, this uh, uh, relationship down the road, because I read an interview with Leslie earlier this week or last week. And she said that they weren't even going to show that Manny was the master until the second season. So there are ideas that there's a second season in her head for this show. Uh, at this point, I don't see it, but maybe we will see. We will see. Um, all right, well, let's take a quick – anything more to say about this section? Anything more that uh, was revealed here that you um, – and uh, well, yeah, I guess I should ask you. The helmet thing, very similar to Luke in the Dagobah cave, right? Like you have to confront yourself, just you and yourself in the Force helmet uh, – in the helmet, rather. Did you like that as a kind of a version of uh, the Dagobah cave, or, or what's your feelings on that? Uh, you know, I, I I didn't I didn't make that Dagobah cave connection. I, oh, okay. I thought more of the end of episode three, where we see the point of view of the the helmet, the mask going on to Anakin oh, right. for the yes. for the very first time, and you hear the breathing. Right. You you know you see the you know the, the point of view of the character. It's like okay, I think I mean maybe Vogel has probably called out this the most from the beginning. Is like oh, yeah. Osha is going to end up being the acolyte, and that. Uh, the way that it is setting up, that's that does seem to be becoming more and more apparent. Right. Yeah, but it makes it stronger if she's resisting more, so that when she commits, it's even more powerful. But again, I don't I think, disagree. Yeah, I yeah, don't no, disagree. I, I, I don't mean to be <laughs> the dead horse. On this one. It's just, it's just my feeling of it all. But yeah, I think also because I've just seen so many cult leader documentaries. You get it. What they do, they go in there, they immediately be like, no. You've always had the power inside you. You've always been able to choose. It's those people that are holding you back. They're the suppressors. They're the suppressing people. You come with me and I'll guide you to where you're going. And it just feels like, you know, she could have seen through that, having been through all of this before. But, you know, we'll see as it goes along. Um, all right, let's take a quick break, Shannon, and then we'll get into the rest of this uh, the show uh, right after this. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. So Vogel dinged me last week because I didn't hum the Kylo Ren theme. Oh yeah, Certainly. and yeah. and I honestly in last week's episode I didn't hear it. <laughs> like oh, it wasn't wow. until I watched the end of last week's episode <laughs> into this week's episode. I was like, oh okay, there it is. I yeah. got it. Yeah, yeah. In the end credits in this week's episode for sure. <laughs> All right, let's move on to this situation here with uh, Soul and May on the sh on the ship here. Um, uh, they do this dance where we're not sure if Soul knows it's May. And certainly all these YouTubers went crazy and people on Twitter went crazy about uh, how would he not know? How would he not know? Well, uh, they fool us for a little while in this section of the show here, Shannon. He lets her, he lets May drive the ship. He lets May fix the power on the ship. He lets May insult the Jedi and try to school him on why he couldn't sense Chimere's danger. A little meta there for some people who are upset about that. Uh, he doesn't interfere when Basil loudly reconnects Pip into the ship's computer and they and the ship's computer uh, or in Pip and uh, Basil comically attack May, tells her he's going to come clean to the high council. She grills him on what he's going to reveal. But when he pauses for a long time, she runs to the council to try to communicate to the high council and he stuns her from behind with Basil looking on uh, and takes off with the ship before Vernestra gets there uh, and May wakes up strapped to a table and it looks like Soul is going to get some answers or tell her what he's wanted to tell her for 16 years. And by the way, that's uh, that's an interesting situation there that uh, juxtaposed to when Osha woke up on uh, Soul ship after what went on on Brendock. So interesting stuff there. Certainly a menacing Soul at the end that looked like maybe there is a darkness to Soul. So 
What are your thoughts on what went on here? Did you like the way this played out or did this feel kind of underwhelming? So this storyline, this is, uh, and, and this is a thing that probably bugs me. This is very much a personal thing, mm -hmm. um, but the passage of time. So yeah. last episode ended, um, Chimere found Osha, Osha who was passed out. We thought he force healed her, but he didn't he because didn't you know right. we see that she's bandaged up. Right. Then we go and when we leave uh, Soul and May and Basil, like they are on the ship. So this episode opens... Chimere has had enough time yeah, yeah. to carry Osha to his ship and go to another planet. Right. That's the opening section of this episode. We cut over to Sol and May, and they are that that ship that they were on at the end of last episode is just taking off. Yep. So that's the type of editing thing that drives me absolutely crazy. Because <laughs> unless you're 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 telling a story that does jump around in time the perception that an audience generally gets is things are being told chronologically. Right. right. And, 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 and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah, or simultaneously. Yes. Yeah, um, but I mean, even like with last episode, it's just like Chimere and, and May are on, are on Kofar or the episode before yeah. they're walking the whole episode. The Jedi get there and boom, they find him right away. So that passage right. of time, kind of drives me nuts and that's what this one is was as well and i was like there's an easy fix here if the ship is jacked up let them be on the planet and the ship is jacked up or or, or have the ship uh uh going through space and it breaks down i mean yeah. there, there are ways and again th this is probably a thing that doesn't bother some of the audience and i wish i wish my slight ocd brain w was had your point of view but for me i'm like that god th this is such an easy mistake to fix yeah um the the moment with uh lee jung jay as he says hey i'm going to go reset this tra this transmitter as you know they're they're getting he's trying to call out for help yeah um that was one of the strongest acting moments that Lee Jung Jae had. And I think part of it was, was it was so strong because there, he didn't need dialogue. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've read that he learned English for this role. So there are going to be some times that his line delivery is not going to, it's not going to sound perfect. Right. Right. Because this is a guy who just learned the language. And I think because it's star Wars, I think you give a little bit of grace there. It's just like, Hey, his, his, where he, where his planet come from, maybe they didn't speak this. Yeah. Um, but that moment where he only had, his eyes and his face and his body to rely on to convey these emotions, to convey this loss that he was feeling, yeah. you really sensed it. Like, and I think Lee Jung Jae has done a great job the whole episode or the whole series. Mm -hmm. I think this, this, what we saw, that was the Lee Jung Jae from Squid Game. And just oh, because yeah. all he had was his face, like you, you felt that sense of loss, that sense of failure that has probably been with him for the last 16 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought that was absolutely great. You go over to the other side to some of the tonal issues where I do agree with you when Basil confronts May and it, Basil starts doing karate or martial arts yeah, yeah, yeah. and then sort of tries to attack her leg at the same time. Pip squirts her with oil. Um, I think those moments, those are Star Wars moments, but I think when you're dealing, when you're, it wasn't the pressure, the pressure release hmm. that comedy can be in a really well told story. Yeah. Um, when I think of like a press release, I think of like Winston Duke in in Black Panther. Like right. you know, you have you have a high stakes story that's being told. You have high stakes moments, and then he is able to come in as Mbaku and able to deliver a little bit of comedy, but without betraying what the story is saying. And I feel like these moments kind of betray it. Um, like, and maybe, maybe it's because the comedy is not being done the best, or, or maybe it's because the rest of the story isn't being done the best, but that moment, I agree with you really, really drove me nuts. Um, and we kind of get to like, what is May trying to do here? Yeah. Like, is, is she just trying to get soul to admit that, you know, something was rotten in Denmark on Brendock, you know, 16 years ago, it's just a little it's just a little confusing. And, you know, we know OSHA is a mechanic. OSHA is a mechanic. Yeah. Does May, May knows how to do stuff too. Like that wasn't the impression that I got when Soul says, take the wheels. Like, does she know how to fly ship? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, and maybe that's just something we have to accept in Star Wars. Like, hey, everyone kind of knows how to fly a ship. Everyone kind of knows how to drive a car right. in this, in this world. Um, 
But then, you know, you have her wake up at the end after Soul has kind of sussed out. And, and I was one of the folks that I was like, man, it just doesn't make sense that Soul wouldn't be like, you're not you're not Osha. Right. But you try to take into the fact that the line that May has, like sometimes, you know, we see what we want to see when you want something so bad. That's what you that's what your reality is. I'm kind of like, OK, you know what, I'll. I'll retract some of that, some of that faux outrage, that geek outrage that I had the week before, yeah. because it's like Saul just Saul wants this to be OSHA. Saul wants to get this problem solved. And the moment that he does and he stuns her from behind. Yeah, there was definitely a darker feeling to Saul in that moment as mm -hmm. May is is, uh, you know, manacled to that to that, you know, platform. Yeah. And do we think Soul's going to torture? Of course not. But it sounds like he is about to. It seems like they're going to Brendock. That's yeah. that's yeah. that's my guess. Um, so overall, a lot of that story didn't work for me, despite the fact that Lee Jung Jae had just a beautiful, beautiful moment. Just you know, exhibiting yeah. just human loss. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we are going to go to it seems like we're going to go to Brendock in the next episode because Koganada, who directed Destiny, the third episode is coming back to direct this episode. So I imagine yeah. that's where we're going to get um, the knowledge of what happened and, and find out because they've been holding this carrot in in front of our faces now for six episodes. And even here in this episode, when. May is grilling soul about like, what are you going to tell the high council? What do you mean? Everything? What else is there to know? You're like, uh, is he going to, and then he pauses and then the power comes back on and she runs over and he stuns her. So I, I'm of the belief that he knew it wasn't May from the beginning and he had just kind of lured her into a sense of comfort. I'm sure he sensed her coming behind her with the knife or coming behind him rather with the knife. And then when he, when she's getting closer, he says, Hey, can you fix the ship or can you drive the ship? And so he was constantly like moving her away. And then when he's looking at the screen and then he's having his own kind of struggles about what happened and then having the question and answer session with her, it's just a way of sucking her in piece by piece. And there's no way he didn't hear Basil rummaging around down there making a crap ton of noise. So the fact that he let that go on makes me feel like he knew what was going on. Let Basil do things with Pip and figure that all out. Possibly. Yeah, Possibly. And, and then, of course, you got the power to come back on, or Pip did, really. That's, that's actually the truth. And so then he stuns her from behind because she's about to send some message that he doesn't approve of because he has told the council at the beginning of this section what's what happened. You know, they lost his entire team, and certainly he's, he's broken up about it. But by the end of this section, there's a darker edge to soul. And I, by the way, Lee Jung Jae in this moment, I was like, oh, that's awesome. You know, as a wrestling fan, when a good guy goes heel, even for just a little bit to make you question it, it's an awesome moment when it's done well. And I thought his slow approach to her and her use, moving her head away like this on the table so there was this space here and she's afraid, that was a fascinating twist. So yeah. Although I didn't maybe like some of the moments here and overall how it all went down, I did like the questioning of of him not being able to sense Chimir and his evil. And of course, a lot of people shot that down over the last week because of what happened in the prequel trilogy. But then when we get the twist at the end, I was even more intrigued to see where that's going to go. You know, right. so that's that's that I know that it wasn't the best uh, uh portrayal of this but I did think the ending had me hooked to go like okay now what is more what happened here uh, so we're going to oh, find definitely, out definitely yeah. definitely curious about what yeah. is going to come next that's that's the thing with this show is like yeah. you can tell at its heart there is a good story here yeah. there is something there 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 was a great pitch that got this show made yeah um I but the great pitch didn't seem <laughs> the, the 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 greatness of the pitch did not transfer over to the yeah. production process in in my opinion. Yeah. That was another thing Johnny is after yeah. Basil clearly outs May, she doesn't seem that concerned. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like granted you're on a ship that's not working great so it's like what what do you where do you go what do you do i'm like well one thing maybe you tie basil down yeah so, so it's a big enough ship that if you can't find the little the little uh hedgehog um it, it's a big enough ship that if you don't see him it's not that big a deal but the right. fact that he just takes off and she doesn't do anything to stop him right it's like right. eh, okay that seems weird yeah exactly exactly and no i know again people are going to be like well it's a big ship you might not hear everything if you want to put it in the comment section, knock yourself out. But I also think you can solve that real easily 
when the noise stops, she can look up, and then we cut to a scene of Sol just driving it, not having heard it. Then you solve the problem. But the thing is that they're asking us to believe that he didn't hear it. You're not showing us that he couldn't have heard it because everything seems like it's close to him. So the way yeah. that ship is designed, it's not a big ship, you know? And so uh, I said, and, and the May situation is so frustrating because you're not sure what they want to do with this character. Because clearly now by having her have the comedic moment, this is a, a, a character who is just about to kill Soul with her knife pulled out. Clearly indication was she was going to kill yet another master Jedi and then you give her this comically stupid moment with Basil and the pip screen. Like, you're, what are you doing here with this character? Like, are you trying to make her a badass? Or are you trying to make her an incompetent badass that we should be laughing at and not feel any fear over? Because that's where I'm at right now with this character. I don't take May seriously at all with anything she's doing. She right. seems like a big waffler who goes with whoever whispers in her ear last. And that is... Uh, it's not a strong character, in my opinion, to to look at because you're trying to present her as this strong character, and she isn't. You know. So that's well, and I think that's that's kind of one of the issues of the show is yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you see these these choices that were made that ultimately probably were not. And, and I'm thinking pr production, writing, directing. You see these choices that were made that this wasn't the strongest. Like there, and, and there's yeah. an easy way to do this, and in, and this happens. This happens in films, um, um, yeah. less so in TV shows because in films, you know, they have that reshoot uh, period built yes. in to a yes. lot of their schedules now yes. television isn't always afforded that but something like a star wars television show this is not the norm this is not the norm yeah. so you see those mistakes that were made that seem pretty easy to rectify and they weren't yeah yeah and you wonder who's coming in and writing in cute little moments cute little star wars moments to keep it star wars -y. i wonder who's coming in and giving notes um <laughs> where have i seen that before i'm just gonna leave that out in the wind all right, let's move on to the last part. That's this lady here, Vernestra. Uh, Shannon, this is very interesting. We go to Coruscant. Vernestra is stressing out about an impending senatorial review of the Jedi Order by senators who are, quote, grabbing for power. Clear reference to what's going to happen in the prequel trilogy, but this is starting to happen 100 years before the prequel trilogy. So there we go. She gets word from one of her Jedi that uh, about what happened on Kofor because Soul had uh, uh, sent that transmission. Uh, she goes to investigate after some we another weird humor moment about her throwing up during hyperspace, which she counters uh, uh, is due to it unsettling her. And for those of you, listen, this works if you've read the High Republic novels, but if you haven't had read the High Republic novels, this is a weird moment. Now, having uh, looked up the Easter eggs, this is a reference to the visions Vernestra would receive during hyperspace a reference first made in the various High Republic novels and comics that depict Vernestra in her younger years. So, again, I don't understand the comical moment if we all haven't read the High Republic shit. Anyway, they take off on a T-6 shuttle, which, of course, gets used by the Jedi in the Clone Wars. They land on Kofar, and essentially Vernestra does a Prince Humberdink scene from Princess Bride as she uses or accesses Force Echoes to relay what happened as they walk around the dead bodies of Jackie and Yord, which really pissed me off. Uh, then she entertains the idea that Soul might be a suspect here because, I mean, he did take off on the ship before they got there, so we might think he's a suspect. And that last scene with her, him and May. Then she kills an Uber moth with her whip, and we can't help but think of the scar on Chimera's back and her inner monologue when she talks about something tipping the scale. So, Shannon, your thoughts on this? Um, we got to see the purple light whip. We got to see Vernestra investigating this situation, uh, teaching another young Jedi about how to explore this thing. Ask the right question. Ask the right question. You tell me, what did you think of this whole sequence here? Where are we headed with Vernestra, man? Um, I mean, the implications is that she was very heavily involved in what happened 16 years ago. Those oh, are the implications right. yes. that, that okay. I that I took from it. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It, maybe maybe I'm incorrect. Yeah. Um, uh, I I think again uh, this this storyline really uh, relies on your main actor's performance, and I just don't think Rebecca Henderson has um, the Star Wars chops. That's not mm. to say that she isn't a good actor. That is to say that in for this particular role, I think she is kind of severely under delivering like it feels more like reciting lines rather than speaking thoughts um that's the that's the vibe that i get mm -hmm. um I, I think her interaction with her padawan uh mog, mog yeah. um mog and, and mog that's an interesting casting choice as well like mog does not give me 
Padawan vibes. I mean, the Jedi, yes, they are they are warrior monks. Yeah. Space wizards. Um, Mog gives me the energy of like a nebbish assistant. Um, and and yeah. that's just one of those casting choices that I'm like, this was an odd performer to choose because the moment where they talk about her, the, she gets, you know, uh, hyperspace sick, I guess. Yeah. Um, like I, that one didn't bother me. Like it, really, oh. it, it, it didn't, the, the concept didn't bother me. The mm. delivery bothered me. And oh, that, okay. It, it, the the idea that uh he's just like oh are you sure you should do this because you know you get sick i don't get sick i, <laughs> I feel uneasy like they're, they're on paper that i do think that moment works without having the context of her um her her in the uh high republic novels and the graphic novels i, yeah. I think that interaction works it just wasn't delivered well because she is so stiff yeah. And just uh, it just kind of reads as false and inauthentic to me. And Mog, again, like I just don't buy anything this actor is saying. Yeah. And, and and that's not to say, again, I, I can't belabor this point enough because being an actor, I've certainly been criticized for performances in the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, that does not invalidate any of the work that they've done before. It's just this was not the best, in my opinion, this was not the best casting. Um kind of you know the 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 expectation and and you know my fault uh the expectation seeing the light whip in the promos is we were going to get something yeah. awesome like ah oh, eh, bug <laughs> yeah, we, we we saw this already but i think more the the um the inclusion of that scene in this episode is we see a a, a unique scar on chimere's back and now yeah. we see a light whip yeah. So the 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 road we are being led down to is okay. Kymir may have been Vernestra's Padawan yeah. at one point, yeah, or and for whatever people. reason, she she felt she needed to stab him in the back. It had to had to light whip him. Um, you know the the idea that she is going to be more directly involved with our main story again. It, I just think it was I just think it was bad casting. Well, it's like if the if the actor can't do the job. Even if they're your spouse, if if their participation in a role this large takes away from the story, you don't cast them. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. I mean, we saw that in She-Hulk uh, when she cast her husband in that role, the, the magician yep. thing, and he was terrible in that role. It happens, and it's unfortunate. Um, I, I like Rebecca as an actress, but I agree with you. I don't think she's bringing that strength and the levels of complexity that you need to have for Vernestra. Again, Rebecca is a good actress. I loved her in Single Drunk Female. But, like, you need something of much more weight and resonance in a performance when you're going to connect it up to possibly Chimere, possibly having anything to do with Brenda. I did not know. I didn't even think that she might have something to do with Brenda until you said it, and then it occurred to me. And that's even more reason that you need someone with who very obviously keeps secrets close to her vest and the reason that she doesn't want the High Council to find out about this shit is because she's going to be seen as the scapegoat for the Jedi Order, possibly being questioned and then removed from power or having their power limited by the Senate because of something that happened 16 years ago, right? So there's a commentary in that, that you got to have the right actress to really deliver these moments. And you're 100% right. The It was the delivery that bothered me. Maybe not the moment. It was the delivery that felt kind of awkward and clumsy and weird out of left field. Mm -hmm. And so there, I felt like maybe the delivery didn't work. So I'll, 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 I'll massage my criticism towards that uh, uh, that way. But like overall, though, I just don't sense the importance. And I also think it's a problem of the story. Why aren't we seeing scenes with her and what she's dealing with, what she's negotiating with her own personal story, is sitting in her quarters or in her, you know, doing her training and the visions are coming to her. Certain things that tease that she has a, br a greater connection to the show or to the overall story right, of, of what happened in Brendock. Why aren't we seeing more of her life? Because just having her pop in and, and remember, remember how a majority of the people watching the show have not read the high Republic novels. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they don't know anything about her. So why not spend more time building that character up so that when these moments happen and she talks about a tipping of the scales of fear she has, there's more resonance to those moments and we can feel them a, little, a bit more deeper. So um, I, I don't, I've, I don't, I'm not going to go as hard in your criticism of Rebecca, but I respect it. It's, but I do agree with you that 
a stronger actress who understands the drama of this a bit more could have really solidified Vernestra as a as a strong character uh, debuting live action here in this particular series. And it is a bit frustrating. And and you're right about Mog. Mog's like, hey, what are we supposed to be doing? You know, it's that kind of thing that you see in cartoons that throws you off and a stronger Padawan. Like, it makes no sense she would have cho chosen a Padawan like this, who's this kind of buffoonish. She And I wonder if that's a casting thing. We want to let her stand out, so we've got to cast a more buffoonish kind of Padawan, so she really has this kind of strength in comparison. But when it, when they're together, it just seems foolish that she'd have chosen this guy to be her uh, Padawan. You know, it seems like a bad choice. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say buffoonish, but he seems weak. That's my and opinion. Yeah. And and I think the the vibe that we've gotten thus far is the Jedi come from a place of strength. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. so I, I don't I don't buy that this guy knows how to use a lightsaber. I don't buy that this guy yeah. can can fight. Um, and, and maybe we are going to be totally surprised in the next two episodes and we find out Mog <laughs> is a complete badass. I fully, I fully leave the door open, but just their energy as a dynamic, yeah. it just doesn't, uh, it, it seems like they don't really have a whole lot of chemistry and also just the choices that they made for his character. Again, yeah. you just get that kind of nebbishy, kind of nerdy, nerdy yeah. guy. It's like, I don't get that from, I don't get that from a Padawan, but yeah. folks who have read that, who have read more of the novels than I have, uh, you might be able to correct me in the comics, in comments, and I imagine you will, you will do so. <laughs> yeah, we've already seen the bumbling guy become a badass with Chimera. I don't think we can go to that well again in the same series with Mog. So I, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to me. But maybe he's the Sith Lord behind all of this. Who knows? Maybe um, it's Ta maybe it's Tasi Loa. Maybe I, it's Yord's Padawan, who we've not seen <laughs> since the first episode. I said that in in our reviews of episode one and two that I think Tasi Loa might be behind all of this. But maybe. <laughs> um, all right, anything more you want to say about the about this particular episode, uh, Shan? It was about thirty two minutes, I think, this particular episode. Thirty five minutes, I think, this particular episode. Your thoughts? No, I mean, what I think it was what I said the episode before last is like this. Yeah. This is that that point that you reach as an audience member. It's like, oh, OK, this show is not going to be what I want it to be. Yeah. And that's OK, because I, I have read online. There are plenty of people that are absolutely digging this show. Very true. And, and I love that for you all that yeah. that are enjoying the show. I wish I wish I were in your shoes um, <laughs> for me. I'm. I am probably maybe I'm part of the problem in that I will pretty much watch almost anything Star Wars. So I, I am going to continue watching this series to the bitter end. And if there's a season two, probably going to be watching that as well. <laughs> I'll be so surprised if there's a season two, judging from the recent ratings. But who knows? Maybe. Yeah. I echo Shannon sentiments. This is a fine show that promises more, but doesn't deliver the more consistently. And this is yet another example, this episode, of that particular uh, thing about the irony is that the consistency of the show is its inconsistency uh, throughout most of the episodes. And even episode five, who we all loved and enjoyed, still had issues with some of the main OSHA stuff and some of the storyline decisions overall. So, yeah, we're marching towards this ending. And as Shannon said, some people really love it. So more power to you. But some of us are looking at this wondering, like, what could have been? And it, it becomes frustrating after a while, for sure. But, yeah. But as Shannon said, we'd love to hear what you all think about it down in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and listening to us. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yes, if you'd like to follow us on social media, on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies, on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media and let me know how wrong I am about all this <laughs> stuff, <laughs> on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore <laughs> on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy, or you can also tell me that I'm wrong in the YouTube comments, which some of you do very consistently. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK2, and if you'd like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the roca says that's right and uh, as i said earlier please remember to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell button so you see when we're dropping all the reviews we do here and all the stuff we do both geek buddies wise and otherwise here on the channel would appreciate it and if you're listening to us on the podcast feed and please subscribe to the podcast feed we want to get more and more people we've jumped up 25 percent over the last month in the amount of people that are listening to our podcast so thank you very much for those of you who've come aboard, but we'd love to have more of you come aboard so we keep increasing the number. So subscribe wherever you download podcasts 
Find the Geek Buddies. Just type that in. We'll pop up our cute little faces there in animated form. Subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a like and then and leave us stars and leave us a review so we can get seen by more and more people in that way as well. So we appreciate it. Thank you all very much. All right. For my uh, partner, uh, Shannon McClung, and the absent uh, Michael Vogel, this has been our spoiler review for episode six of the Acolyte on Geek Bites, brought to you by the Geek Buddies. <gasps>